looking at is uh, someone who I have a great deal of uh, admiration for, and I will talk about him a little bit further as uh, the talk goes on. <clears throat> but I will just read the notes here, and please bear with me. Perhaps there was no greater proponent of radio advancement in the U.S. military than Major General George Owen Square, who was Chief Signal Officer of the U.S. Army, would organize American industry and manufacturing by laying out a strategy for scientists and engineers to modernize the U.S. Army means of communication. Images of how this came about and the technologies as developed and incorporated will be the focus of this photo montage. Squire was a technocrat, graduating with a PhD in electrical engineering from Johns Hopkins. He would bring his knowledge and vision to the U.S. Army at a time ripe for change. What these concepts were and how he imposed them on others will provide insight into just how this would spur a new dynamic, creating a new form of command and control in the military. At the start of World War I in 1914, wireless communication was limited to spark gap transmissions. Within a few short years, this would be supplemented and then supplanted by thermonic, thermonic valve or trio vacuum tubes, system using continuous way, CW, for telegraphic and voice transmission. By the end of World War I, portable radio telephony systems were being used on aircraft, presaging what would become the golden age of radio in the 1920s. World War I would not be the first major conflict to be fought at the dawn of the 20th century. However, because of wide geographical expanse of the conflict and the use of extraordinarily deadly technologies, the resulting casualties would be unparalleled. Over the four-year duration of the war, the attempt to gain the initiative would advance the scope of many technological innovations, including communications. Within this framework, the nascent electronics industry was born and would cast a very long shadow. All of the belligerents in the First World War used spark gap radio transmission technology during the conflict. This rudimentary communication system was only capable of wireless telegraphy and not voice. Battlefield requirements would push the technological envelope of this system. Issues remained, however, with mutual interference and intercept vulnerability. <coughs> Transmission signals from spark units are in the form of dampened side waves spread over many frequencies, creating severe multiple mutual interference between adjacent stations and limiting their battlefield effectiveness. The solution was the use of continuous wave, CW transmission, which supports a large number of non-interfering channels on multiple discrete frequencies. Think AM radio. Although scientists and engineers understood this principle before 1914, it could not be reasonably implemented until the vacuum tube became available. By 1916, vacuum tubes were in mass production by almost all the major belligerents, and yet they were used mainly for interception of enemy signals and not for primary field communications. This would shift and only slowly beginning in 1917. In contrast, the Americans enthusiastically exploited CW technology spearheaded by the Navy and the Army. This move to continuous wave illustrates a change in the culture of engineers and the U.S. military. By 1917, they had already begun developing under Square's leadership CW systems for telegraphy and voice. With America's entry into the war, the mass production of these units was already underway. Their deployment to the front lines forever changed the way wars would be fought. <clears throat> so you said the AM type is called continuous wave? Is that what, did I get you right? 
AM radio works on the basis of individual frequencies. That's why you're not listening to the entire AM spectrum. When you have a spark gap transmission, it would be the equivalent if you turned in AM and had all the channels broadcast to you at once. Uh, the um, What you would hear would be just garbled. You wouldn't be able to pick out. And so when you have uh, spark transmissions, the problem was that you had overlapping of the frequency uh, transmissions. And only if you did something what the Americans wound up doing, which is create a rotary uh, gap uh, brass disc, which John will talk about briefly. Right, John? Yep. Uh, it's in there. That, uh, that uh, gives you a modicum of separation because of tonal difference. So, uh, anyway. Actually, they were doing two things. They were also changing the tap. They were changing the tap on the transformer as well, and uh, which gave them radio frequency, <coughs> a degree of radio frequency separation into the, basically into your various bands. You know, you, you're familiar with 10 meter, 20 meter, 40 meter. They would have a little bit of control that way. This was during World War One. Yeah. Right. But it, it still created problems because you would easily step on another transmission and not everyone was unified in their uh, uh, transmission. So if the French were transmitting and the Brits were transmitting and the Americans were transmitting and they were all using Spark, it wasn't coordinated and so you could get stepped on and get mutual interference. And that's why when they started using continuous wave, which can only be done with a tube where you have selected frequencies because you could tune the frequency to a selected bandwidth as you do with AM, that is when you could pre-select the frequency to tune onto, and you would have a coordinated uh, transmission. So, you know, tune to this channel, transmit on that channel. Once you had that established, then you could uh, transmit and receive. Anyway. Yeah, one way to think about spark gap is that lightning strike that you hear in your, or your AM radio. Sunspots. Yeah, that's, that's a spark gap. I mean, that, but it doesn't matter what station you're listening to, you're going to hear the thunderstorms not coming through. And everyone else all at once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, on August 27th, 1910, J.D. McCurdy, flying a Curtis airplane over Sheepshead Bay, New York, transmitted a series of intelligible letters to the ground. Uh, Captain Henry M. Morton of the Air Service designed the Spark Gap transmitter and Colonel Clarence C. Culver constructed the receiving set. Uh, with need to concentrate on flying, and sen the sending key was mounted on the control wheel of the aircraft. The antenna consisted of 60 foot uh, uh, feet of wire that was thrown overboard trailing while in flight. It was not uh, uh, an intelligible message, it was just a series of Morse codes. Just to show that uh, you could transmit uh, from the air, uh, up, and so that, that was a major step forward. Uh, Clarence C. Culver would figure prominently uh, in the U.S. Air Service uh, for wireless transmissions. So this is here at the Air and Space, and John and I have discovered that this is a significant item. Uh, designed and built by Oscar C. Uh, Rosen, that's R-O-E-S-E-N, an electrical engineering student at S Stevens uh, Institute in uh, New Jersey. This wireless transmitter was mounted on a Curtis uh, pusher aircraft uh, flown again by McCurdy at Bridgeport, Connecticut in an aviation meet in May 1911. So that's almost a year later. Uh, the wireless communication was established with an operator stationed 
in the dome of the World Building in New York City, 55 miles away. Uh, this system was probably one of the first sets capable of both sending and receiving wireless messages flown on an aircraft. And it, and it is significant because uh, this is two-way communication and it was a complete message. And so, um, and we have it, and it's very fortunate. It's probably one of the only uh, units of uh, the period uh, that were early, early flight. So here we are. This is uh, uh, Clarence uh, Curtis Culver. Uh, we all know of Culver City in California, and that's a family uh, name. Uh, that's one of the family members uh, found that. Uh, he's not a colonel here yet, he goes on to become one. He attended the University of Nebraska and graduated in 1898 with a degree in electrical engineering. Following the August uh, 1910 experiments of wireless communications from the aircraft, he proposed in October of that year the feasibility of developing an airplane radio telephone and voice uh, command uh, flying. Between 1915 and 1916, he accomplished successful radio transmissions from aircraft to receivers up to 140 miles away and developed means of insulating engine magneto sounds from sending and receiving Morse code communications uh, in flight, which is a substantial because the magneto is a spark generator and would interfere, and so that was an issue that they had to deal with. In 1916, he earned his junior military aviator rating. Now, that's a very interesting rank at the time because uh, that uh, was how the, uh, the air service, uh, they had uh, a junior military aviator, senior military aviator, military aviator <laughs> ranking. In June of that year, uh, he built with E.J. Simpson, a New York radio engineer, a radio telephone set embodying the results of his experiments in the 1915-1916. In February 1917, they built and transmitted for the first time the human voice for an airplane in flight in the U.S. In May 1917, he sent to Europe. He was sent to Europe. Uh, to demonstrate radio equipment and to investigate the requirements of radio equipment should meet in combat. Uh, he received the Medal of Merit in 1916, the Distinguished Service Medal in 1919, and the Civilian Certificate of Merit in 1919 from the Aero Club of America, all for his activities related to aviation radio communications. And pictured here with um, and I have the name wrong here. Uh, he's the head of the Aeronautics uh, Division uh, communication side of the Bureau of Steam Engineering. Uh, John and I have found in our research and in the collection at the museum a lot of cross-pollination between the Army and the Navy of systems were implemented and used. Uh, the only difference between them was what the Navy called it and what the Army called it. Uh, so uh, there's more to be uh, determined on that as time goes on. So uh, this, what you're looking at here, is an SCR-65, which is uh, between 1915 and 1918, is designed based on the British Airborne Spark wireless transmitter. It's a tuned spark coil transmitter producing dampened waves in a wavelength range of 100 to 300 meters with a, a, a 0.4 ampere output, which is very low. Uh, it's a 120 foot wire arrow running off of a reel would be wound out by the observer to enable transmission. Uh, power is provided by a six volt uh, wind power generator and the spiral inductors is mounted on a hard rubber lid together with four terminals and two uh, removable clips. A side window permitted viewing of the spark gap. Uh, that's what that little window there is for, so you can actually see it. Uh, due to its low power and uh, the nature of what it was, it was relegated uh, only to training. And you can see the numbers mark where your, uh, your, um, uh, your meter range was and what you transmitting on. 
Uh, Major General George Owen Square, the Chief Signal Officer of the US Army, uh, Square was instrumental in the establishment of the Aeronautical Division. How many of you knew that? Okay. Uh, of the US Signal Corps. Fort Myer, Virginia, in September 12, 1908, he became the first military passenger in an airplane. Uh, with Orville Wright as the pilot, they set the world record for flight endurance with a passenger of nine minutes and six and a third seconds. And working closely with the Wright brothers in 1909, he was responsible uh, for the purchase of uh, aircraft uh, by the U.S. Uh, Army. Square was chief of the aviation section from 1916 to 1917. Is that square? Or square. square. It's spelled S Q U I E R, but it's pronounced square. Um, he was promoted to major general and appointed chief signal officer during World War I. His patent for telephone carrier multiplexing uh, in 1910 led to his induction into the National Academy of Sciences in 1919. Uh, was when Square was asked how to pronounce his name in an interview by the literary digest, he responded that it sounded like the word square. So that settles it. Uh, the importance, uh, I should note, of uh, telephone carrier multiplexing is why we can have multiple phone calls on one line. Up until that time, if you look at phone lines uh, in cities, there was a separate phone line for each individual exchange. Uh, that was because they didn't have a way before Square came up with multiplexing of transmitting uh, separate, you know, on uh, multiple phone calls on one line. So you see these pictures of these huge telephone poles with dozens and dozens of lines on it, and that's the reason. It's really interesting, because that helps take a photograph sometimes. The Western Electric VT-1 triode, uh, it's a receiving vacuum tube, 1917 to 1920. Square and his engineering team realized early on that in order to produce wireless systems powerful and reliable enough to be effective for use in war, the key to success would be to produce vacuum tubes that had sufficient power output, were reliable, provided consistent operational properties, and would be robust enough to function in the varying environments of frontline service. Square turned to the American industry for the answer. At that time, there were only a handful of companies who had the knowledge or technology to produce tubes. At the forefront was Western Electric, uh, and. Western Electric was wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T. Uh, it was this company that the problem of design and perfection for mass production of the vacuum tube could be solved. Now get this. The total production of tubes in the US would step up from 21,000 per year to over 1 million per annum within 18 months of the program start. So just as we began to uh, prepare for war and Square got Western Electric involved, uh, the order of magnitude uh, from 21,000 to over a million is phenomenal. You can still find these tubes available new in box. Uh, they go for a lot of money. They're collectors, items, uh, people who are involved in the audio industry, uh, antique radios, uh, swear by them because they're so robust and they long lasting. Uh, the VT2, uh, which is the transmitting uh, vacuum tube uh, from 1917 to 1920. The progress of vacuum tube designed by Western Electric for the U.S. military proved to be a critical element in the development of the uh, aircraft-borne radio telephone. Uh, Western Electric had accumulated a great deal of knowledge and experience from its development of vacuum tubes for the telephone uh, repeater network 
uh, system was built a few years earlier. Uh, this proved to be critical as new design parameters were required for the SCR units in, in development. Most importantly, the power transmitting tube required an unprecedented advance in triode design. The tube would have to have characteristics of mechanical strength, high freedom from gas, ionization, and high transmission output, uh, and yet remain small and compact. So the story about uh, AT&T and the vacuum tube, um, <clears throat> they did not produce the vacuum tube for uh, distribution because it would be uh, copy uh, and uh, infringement and they'd have to pay substantial fees for that prior to the war. But they were permitted to build the tube under license for themselves uh, because they bought out the license uh, and the copyright um, uh, to, to do it uh, and subject to uh, use within the company to have long lines of telephone so that telephone communication could be established between uh, cities going from the East Coast to the West Coast, even from New York to Chicago, would require re repeater equipment because signal degradation on long lines would prohibit uh, the, the means of doing that. And so the vacuum tube was the answer, and what it did is it reamplified the signal and then passed it along. So it's sort of like a, a brigade of uh, these throughout the country, uh, these stations, and so they had a, a good sense of it. They were also uh, able to produce the first uh, wireless transmitter for transoceanic uh, wireless communication using CW, and that was right over in Virginia. So uh, they had a lot of experience in So this is the, uh, the vaunted SCR-68 system. So the, the thing is, is the development of this system was um, uh, hugely successful in its development in the lab, and, but in the practical sense of distributing it and making it available in the field, it was not. It had problems ranging from uh, faulty connections because they were building uh, thousands of these units. They built over 3,000 of these units. Uh, they were deployed to the front for testing. There are uh, lots of reports talking about it. And the issues that they had with them uh, deal with the connections. Uh, having some background in audio and electronics, and have had the chance of looking through it, uh, it's very rudimentary. It, 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 Quality control and quality assurance was not up to par at the time because this was a new industry and there were a lot of components involved. But if you notice, there's a generator <coughs> uh, going to a filter unit, uh, then feeding to the, the radio set itself. Uh, you also have uh, this box here, which you see is connected to two headsets and the two microphones and their connecting uh, block. Well, this is an intercom system. And what it enabled is the pilot and the observer to communicate with one another in the cockpit. And for a DH-4, if any of you have ever looked <coughs> at the placement of the pilot from the uh, uh, observer, you will note that there's a, a great deal of separation between them, and it's not an easy way to communicate <coughs> with a Gosport in, in the air. Um, the uh, interphone permitted that, and so that was one of the byproducts. So more about the SCR-68. The radio telephone set used on airplanes uh, for both transmitting and receiving voice messages to and from the plane while in flight. The Cigna Corps pamphlet 20 details the purposes of these units. The SCR-68 and SCR-68A sets are the airplane radio telephone transmitting and receiving sets designed primarily for interplane communication work between airplanes and squadron formations. These sets are used by the commanders of the squadrons. The other planes of the squadrons 
are usually equipped with the type SCR59 receiving set. The set is also used for two-way communication with ground stations equipped with the SCR67 and 67A sets. The concept of aircraft formations operating through a central command was an innovative one, and there is little doubt it would have increased operational effectiveness and uh, reconnaissance and eventually pursuit squadrons had the war gone on into 1919 because already uh, by the time that this was being deployed to the front, newer and improved versions uh, were to come out and already uh, in the pipeline. So this is the uh, interior of the the SCR-68. Uh, the receiver it operated on between 500 and 1600 kilohertz. Uh, the transmitter was between 600, uh, 670 and 1500 kilohertz. Uh, this uh, complete unit uh, contains the three VT-1, uh, which are <coughs> receiving tubes on the right. Uh, the two transmitter tubes are installed uh, with the wound coil on the left. Uh, and uh, this set is unique. Uh, it's in the collection because it has the original batteries still in it, and it has the ballast tube. And of all the pictures and uh, uh, units that I've seen uh, out there, uh, I've not seen any of the units that have as complete a uh, setup as this. So uh, we're very fortunate to have that. The, uh, the project of uh, building the aircraft radio telephone system uh, commenced after a meeting with Colonel Reese of the RFC and Captain Culver at the time and Major Jewett formerly of Western Electric uh, with uh, General Square on May 22nd, 1917. So that's the date that they decided to, to build this. By June 30th, so we're talking about May 22nd, by June 30th, a soapbox model uh, was tested at Langley Field on a JN4B, and I believe those pictures that we see of Culver are from that uh, testing. After six days of uh, testing, uh, the development of a practical system was undertaken, and by war's end, 3,150 units were built, and this unit would be used uh, by the flight commander for transmission of orders to the rest of the flight who were equipped with the SCR-59. Uh, there were squadrons in uh, the United States who were, at the time uh, of uh, late 1918, uh, already being trained flying uh, under command control so that the whole squadron was set up with uh, a command pilot and they were flying uh, the 59s and they would have been deployed uh, to the front as a command control squadron and the war ended. Uh, this is uh, both a connecting diagram and a, uh, a schematic and showing the uh, the layout, and interestingly enough, the way they got around uh, the issue of plugging the wrong thing into the wrong hole was uh, by separating the distance of the prongs so that you couldn't plug the wrong thing in, theoretically couldn't plug the wrong thing into the wrong hole, uh, but also uh, the amount of uh, connectors you had on it. Now this is rarer than hen's teeth. This is the SCR-67 ground radio telephone, and I've only seen one of these. This is in a private collection um, by, owned by James Terhune here in Virginia. Uh, it was not really all that powerful. There was an issue uh, with transmission from the ground to the air, uh, not having enough power. Um, uh, Armstrong, who went on to dev uh, develop and devise uh, the superheterodyne, which is what made uh, all uh, radio transmissions possible uh, for commercial use later on, was central to the uh, answer to that. 
where they cascaded the signal coming off of this unit into multiple uh, amplifiers and feeding it uh, then into antenna and powerful enough just to brute force get it out there. Uh, this is the 59, uh, the 59 receiver. Uh, this would go into the, uh, uh, the rest of the squadron uh, and for reception from the command. Into what squadron? Into the, the rest of the squadron. So you, you have a squadron of, of a flight of, uh, you would have one command pilot and everyone else would have this. And this is the interior. You can see it's rather simple, straightforward. But there were a lot of problems with these units. And it took time. It was a teething issue of uh, building these units under uh, mass quantity. Thousands of these units were built. And this, as you can see again, is the layout. Um, so it was intended for uh, two-seater aircraft. What does one of those units weigh about? Uh, about 10 pounds, but there was a lot more to the whole system, and I think the system total uh, interior with the, on the plane with the generator uh, brought it up to into 40, 50 pound range. Don't hold me to that, but that's kind of the case. Batteries were weighed a lot. Uh, this is the 57 inter phone system I told you about. This is a, 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 a intercom. I don't know if any of you uh, had in your uh, early school days, uh, but in the, in, I'm dating myself here, but in the 1960s, one of our electronics projects, or electricity project, or electrical shop in junior high school, was to build our own intercom. And basically, it was on this design, uh, just using uh, transformer coil, switches and battery. Uh, the two sets of batteries, one set was for each uh, of the systems. So uh, the, uh, one set of batteries was for pilot, one set of batteries was for co-pilot. And um, I don't know what the, the lifetime of those batteries were at that time, but I'm sure they went through them just as quickly as we go through batteries. Do those like the old ones that were about this big look like little can dry cells? Uh, yeah, basically like a, uh, <coughs> a, a D cell. Uh, so here's a helmet. This is from the, uh, with the earphones, uh, and this is in the National Collection. Uh, the earpiece head, uh, headsets were originally uh, sewn in L uh, aviator helmets with cork and fabric to create a seal from ambient noise. Uh, another setup was also developed by mounting the receivers on a skeleton headband and this was put on before the helmet. Uh, the headband and helmet held speakers tightly against the ears and shut out engine noise. And they went from cork quickly to rubber. Uh, it's much better, much more comfortable. Uh, they had, uh, reading the Gorel reports, they had um, helmet fitters sent out from the uh, signal corps to help the pilots put them on properly because you really needed a good seal. Uh, to uh, to be able to use it. So this is the uh, uh, the T1 uh, Western Electric uh, chest microphone for flight communication, and one of the most difficult hurdles encountered and never wholly resolved during this period of time is the difficulty of producing a microphone uh, to work in a noisy environment of an open cockpit air. Uh, microphones at this time were carbon element type, which is basically what you have on your telephone. Uh, so the, and I'm not talking about cell phone. Uh, the initial unit was a chest mount that, that could be flipped up to the mouth or down out of the way. And the helmet, uh, the element was housed in an insulated metal frame that permitted only close speaking to the microphone to limit the ambient noise. But, and how many of you have heard of the company Magnavox? Well, they got their, uh, their start by creating uh, the first moving coil speakers. And that was not with a permanent magnet, that was with a, uh, an electromagnet. And they got involved in building a, um, an, what they call an anti-noise microphone, which we have two in the National Collection, one here and 
one sitting on our uh, the uh, F5L uh, radio compartment, which is kind of interesting. This noise canceling microphone uh, was designed to enhance voice communication when using aircraft radio telephone. Uh, this same t microphone was supplied to General Electric for the spray shield cover for the Navy. Uh, the General Electric, uh, in turn, supplied uh, this, as I said, to the Navy. This, um, the way this worked, uh, <coughs> this was achieved by cutting away the rear uh, and closing parts of an ordinary microphone, uh, thus allowing ambient noise to strike both sides of the vibrating diaphragm more or less equally. Uh, the sound, or the voice, that is closer to the front will create a high pressure gradient on the diaphragm than the sound from the rear, causing it to move effectively, uh, canceling out the ambient noise. It's a very rudimentary form of a differential microphone. It's a mechanical version of a differential microphone for the system. So this is the airplane uh, radio uh, antenna reel. This is a, an interesting um, uh, d development on how they uh, came to develop this. The radio antenna for aircraft uh, wireless consisted of two to 300 feet of finely braided uh, copper wire on a trailing for the plane with a lead weight of approximately uh, one and a quarter pounds attached to the end. And in order to deploy or retrieve the antennas, a sophisticated reel unit was developed which, when released, automatically allowed the wire to uh, uh, wire to unwind with a centrifugal braking device. Uh, this prevented the excessive speed of unwinding and the possibility of breaking the wire, uh, which was all too common in uh, standard reel systems. And prior to the development of this, if you uh, let out the reel and you just let it go, if you didn't uh, hand slow that down, it would just snap and go off on its own. Uh, so they came up with this design, and that's pretty clever. Carl? Those wooden, that wooden uh, disc arrangement, <coughs> wooden spool arrangement. You think that's think part of it? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. We'll have to take a look yeah, at yeah, that. Yeah, we will. And uh, another thing on that, notice that square stamp just under the hub? Right. Looks an awful lot like the stamps that were on the, uh, on some of the impellers. Then we've yeah. got to take a close look on that. Yeah. John and I are taking a close look at uh, what we have in the collection and we're looking at some of the uh, publications from the period and they're finding some really neat things out. I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'm not going to go into it because otherwise uh, he'll be upset with me. Uh, so, um, this is the DH-4 that's uh, downtown. Uh, this uh, aircraft was used by the US Army Air Service. Um, it was the first produced, and it remained out at uh, the Cook Field for um, testing. Um, so they were testing a lot of different systems. They were testing cameras. They were testing um, electrical. We know that it had. Um, Generator here and a generator here. This generator is for the electrically heated suits. And this generator here, which is a GN4, is for the radio. And we're not sure what radio was actually uh, used in it. There was probably a series of radios that were used in it. But there's more to be said about this, and I'm going to just pass that over. You can also see in this picture the camera port and a uh, uh, probably a meniscus lens in that square port behind her, just forward of it, right. for an observer's uh, viewport. And for this, either this bomb or camera. is probably for advancing the film, automatic advancement. <coughs> So this brings us to the F5L, and I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity or, uh, or even know, but we have an F5L uh, hull in the National Collection. How many of you have ever seen it? It's a magnificent piece. It's, it's like 
furniture. It's the best way of describing it. And uh, there weren't a lot of them built. Uh, it was the uh, final version of the uh, Curtis flying boats uh, and the Felixstowe design. Uh, it's slightly different than the uh, British uh, version. Uh, Colin Ellers and I have discussed this at length. And uh, there's some really interesting bits, but I won't go into that. But what I will go into is this unit. Uh, and just to quickly say something about the F5L, uh, it was a collective design uh, development based on the British Felix Stowe F5, uh, which in itself was the development of the improvement to the Curtis H16. Follow that line? Okay. When the US Navy received plans of the F5 and quickly realized that it would require modifications to be built and flown by the US Navy, uh, with its uh, greater load carrying capacity and increased flight time, the F5L was equipped with a complete wireless system for both Morse code and radio telephony, as well as full onboard interphone system enabling all the members of the crew to communicate with one another. So what we're looking at here is a Marconi radio. Marconi built this for the um, uh, uh, US Navy. Uh, Manufactured the first large order of Navy designed 200 watt uh, transmitters. Now, the American SCR uh, uh, 68 uh, was 5 watt. Uh, this is 200 watt. Uh, contemporary accounts uh, stated this set was able to work continuous wave uh, telegraphy. Uh, with theoretical range of 150 miles, and voice communication with a range of 60 miles. Uh, this set gave us lots of trouble and was never particularly reliable, <coughs> although when in first-class condition, it would operate and the range obtained was very good. Um, so, installed, including all the components and the receiver and transmitter, it weighed roughly 210 pounds, so that's all the components, not just this. Um, interesting installation also contained components of the Army's SCR-68 system for interphone and aircraft-to-aircraft -aircraft communication. So they didn't use this if they were flying in formation. They would use the SCR-68, and uh, the, uh, the intercom was the same as the 68. What made this particularly different, the 68? was the fact that GE uh, had developed these VT-10 tubes, uh, the uh, plyotron tube, uh, one acting as an oscillator, the other acting as a modulator. And the battery and dynamo that powered the system, uh, those uh, found to be insufficient to keep the batteries charged. Uh, while on water, the battery-powered uh, telegraph transmission could be made by erecting a small teles uh, telescoping mass uh, which was stored in the tail of the airplane. So, uh, in other words, um, this system, uh, though uh, of high output, again, was teething uh, problems with developing and building something that was robust enough. Uh, and this one is in the National Collection. We have a second one, which is actually on the F5L. And it's uh, complete, it's missing uh, the tubes. Uh, we don't know uh, if it came with us, uh, came to us with the tubes or not. And you can see in this picture that the remaining uh, portion of the gridded uh, setup is over here. And on the shelf there is the uh, Magnavox microphone. As you can see, there's quite a bit in the National Collection on it, and it's an interesting area because it tells a story of something that we don't know about. Uh, by the war's end in 1918, the United States had deployed radio telephones over the skies of France to ascertain operational possibilities and characteristics. Although there were inherent problems uh, with both manufacturing and design defects that prevented its functional integration, it was an important beginning, as was the use of the airplane. By the time the next World War began in 1939, 
both were indispensable. The RFC, who designed and constructed one of the first aircraft radio telephones in 1915, for mysterious reasons did not utilize it until 1918, and then only for the aerial defense of London, although there were limited non-operational tests conducted in France. It is interesting to note that the American firm GE built some of these units for them. The Germans would continue to use Spark as well as CW tube units and had developed a sophisticated radio telephone unit of their own, but there are no indications it had ever been used at the front. The French had perhaps some of the best laboratories working on wireless technology during the war. They constructed their own radio telephone and tested it over the skies of Verdun. Unfortunately, due to the issues of engine noise and uh, interference, as well as ever-present French concern over security, no further developments occurred either. The advantage the U.S. had was its manufacturing base, which was able to produce a higher quality, more powerful, and standardized vacuum tube. I can't emphasize that enough. This, coupled with the support of the military, enabled and encouraged the accelerated CW-based wireless program that was led by Major General George O. Square. All the objects of this photo essay, except for, for the one, uh, one SCR-67, can be found in the National Ace Air and Space Museum's collection. They represent only a portion of the wireless systems employed by the U.S. during World War I. They provide, along with operational manuals, books, articles, and images, a rich resource on the topic of wireless communication in its earliest and formative period of development. Thank you. And I'll take any questions if there are any or comments. Steve?